Hello guys, Winston here. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you're probably well aware that I am a bit of an aerospace geek. But of all of the pieces of aviation, rocketry, and engineering content that I've consumed, and trust me, there are a lot of those kinds of videos in my YouTube watch history, the one that resonates with me the most is How Rockets Are Made by Destin from Smarter Every Day. In that video, Tori Bruno, CEO of the United Launch Alliance, walks Destin through all of the major fabrication and assembly steps needed to build the structure of a rocket. And along the way, you get to pixel peep to the public affair officer's heart's content at all the nitty gritty stuff that happens in the factory. It's impossible to overstate this, but I freaking love this. Manufacturing doesn't get enough exposure or appreciation. Like plenty of people ask what full flow staged combustion is, no one asks how full flow staged combustion becomes a reality. The part of the Rocket Factory Tour video that I replayed the most though was the part where they showed how raw aluminum sheets get turned into the structural skin of a rocket. It's an incredible process with big stupid amounts of aluminum stock and bigger CNC's. And it inspired me to make a little desk piece as an homage to the isogrid pattern used in the structure of the Atlas V rocket, an isogrid drink coaster. But making just one of these would be a pretty trivial task, so why not make a dozen? Why not indeed? This is how I did just that. Every project begins with an initial concept. In this case, it was to take a piece of aluminum and remove as much material as possible in an isogrid pattern while leaving just enough metal to perform the function of isolating a beverage and its condensation from a tabletop. This design, I found, is something that works best leveraging Fusion 360's thin extrude feature, where you can turn a sketch line into a three-dimensional wall, plus the circular pattern feature. These two features in combination minimize the amount of design work you need to do in a project that has these regular repeating shapes. In the initial design phase of my project, my first concern was figuring out how thick the isogrid walls needed to be. These ribs needed to be thick enough to survive the weight of a fully loaded ceramic mug coming down on them at an average speed and with a modest safety factor. I didn't want them denting easily because that would forever ruin the beautiful aesthetic of the piece. But not only would that be antithetical to the entire purpose of an isogrid, the thinner the ribs were, the less heat transfer you would get from your beverage and the more volume you have to catch condensation. Side note, conductive heat transfer is actually a really big deal with aluminum drink coasters because the coaster itself will become a secondary source for the formation of condensation. So you absolutely want to minimize the amount of surface area in contact with your drinking vessel. In the end, I settled for a rib thickness of 2.5 millimeters. That seemed visually like a good compromise on strength and weight. However, the design of the isogrid needed to be tempered by the realities of how I would be machining the coasters. There would need to be fillets in the corners of equal or greater radius than that of my chosen cutter for this job. Since I would be machining these coasters on the Nomad 3, which sadly does not have a tool changer, I wanted to use a single roughing and finishing end mill. The ideal size end mill to achieve reasonable detail at a reasonable speed was an eighth of an inch. However, using fillets with a radius of 2mm, there is a not insignificant volume of material left behind in the intersections of the isogrid. So deviating from the Atlas V design, I added circular bores at the intersections to further reduce weight. The last design aspect I had to balance was the overall thickness of the coasters in order to produce a convincing isogrid. A coaster that's thin is ideal. They stack up nicely, drinks that are placed off center have a lower probability of tipping, but if the depth of the isogrid pockets is excessively short, it doesn't really work as an isogrid. There needs to be the impression of volume, otherwise you don't get a sense of that delightful absence of heft when you pick it up. So to figure out what would look best and feel the best, I printed out a coaster with a thickness of 3mm and one at 4.5mm. These were heights where the coaster would still easily pass the unofficial Starbucks tip test. And from this simple mock-up, it was pretty clear that the taller coaster looked way more convincingly like an aerospace park. You can take it too far, however, and looking at renders of coasters beyond 6mm, they just seemed a bit too chunky, at least for this application. Maybe a trivet would be a more appropriate application for the thicker version of this isogrid, but that's beyond the scope of this video. To keep my coaster from slipping and sliding around, and to further minimize conductive heat losses, I would stick adhesive backed cork on the bottom of the coasters. In the interests of using as little cork as possible because I'm a cheap stingy bat- 
In the interests of continuing the theme of maximum weight reduction, I'd apply boomerang-shaped pieces of laser-cut cork. This shape would be easy and efficient to nest, so I could cover a bunch of coasters with very little cork. With the design parameters locked down, it was time to figure out how to cut these coasters out. And given that I wanted to use the Nomad 3 for precision versus the Shape Oko 4 or Shape Oko Pro, there was one thing I wanted to address first. The Nomad 3 is not a machine you can run like Titans of CNC. To use an analogy, the Nomad 3 is like a scalpel, while the Shape Oko is more of a machete, so it doesn't hog through material quickly. Doing full width contour cuts in aluminum plate stock to cut out my coaster's profile would be painfully slow and stressful. The solution? Acquire laser cut blanks to machine. Not only does this save me a ton of time, but it's actually surprisingly cost effective compared to cutting out my own blanks. A laser cutter working with big sheets of aluminum can nest hexagons way more efficiently than I can in 8x8 or 12x12 plates of aluminum. For this task, I use the online service Send Cut Send, and I picked them after comparing their prices with several other top search results on Google like Zometry, Oshcut, and others. The quality and cost of their work seemed very reasonable, and they had 3 16th inch aluminum stock which was a big plus. Starting from a quarter inch plate would have cost me extra time on the CNC since the coasters would only be 4.5mm thick. Send Cut Send didn't sponsor this project, I actually chose not to reach out to them before starting this project, but I was really happy with the parts they sent me. If you want to try them out, I've got an affiliate link in the description below. I will point out that there are a couple things you might want to keep in mind with when using laser cut parts like this, and these are not specific to Send Cut Send. Number 1. If your parts are deburred for you, the edges will often end up slightly beveled. 2. There will often be an entry artifact on the perimeter where the laser starts and stops cutting. You can grind this off or deal with it on the CNC later. 3. If you're going to anodize laser cut parts, you need to consider the heat affected zone. The thermal energy from the process of laser cutting can alter the crystalline structure of metals and oxidize the material adjacent to the kerf. When you grow an oxide layer on top of this, which is what anodizing is, it can look visually distinct from the neighboring material. This is much more pronounced in processes like welding and plasma cutting, which pump way more energy into the metal, but it's still something to consider here. This is one area where water jet cutting has a big advantage. Taking these things into account, if I wanted to have a good looking precision machine part from laser cut stock, I would need to machine at least half a millimeter off all the edges. So I ordered my stock a bit oversized. The laser cut blanks I ordered arrived within the estimated delivery window, and then it was time to think about machining. The first challenge here was figuring out how to make best use of the limited space on the Nomad 3's table. These wouldn't fit well in a rectangular pattern with enough space in between for end mill clearance, but after a few minutes of futzing around, I realized that rotating the blanks would make everything fit nicely in the 8x8 inch work envelope. Now, the necessity of arranging my blanks so closely together meant that using vices or side clamps was not practical. I could maybe have gotten away with it if I was using something like Mighty Bites hexagonal fixture clamps, but it still would have been a bit of a tight fit, and it wouldn't solve the problem of needing to be able to machine all the sides of my part. I need to get access to the walls to eliminate the laser cut texture on the edges, as well as that heat affected zone. So for a limited run, I would settle on using my favorite lazy person's work holding method, double sided tape. But double sided tape by itself isn't a precision work holding method. I can only stick down a hexagon of aluminum by eye with so much accuracy. Instead, I would count on the fixture to tell me where to place my stock. I would machine some reference features into my custom fixture in order to tell me exactly where the Nomad was expecting the blanks to be. Remember, I've got up to a millimeter of margin for error, so this method should be plenty accurate enough for my needs. In terms of cam, this project isn't that complicated, but we do have to be meticulous about our toolpaths in order to get the best looking parts possible. I said before that I wanted to use an 8th inch end mill for most of this project in order to minimize tool changes, so the only tool change I would have for a set of 4 coasters would be at the end when I would add a chamfer. For now, we'll start with a shallow adaptive toolpath with a large step over to flatten my blank to its near final height. Next, I'll use a bore operation to make the circular holes in my isogrid pattern, and then we'll go back to an adaptive toolpath to make the defining triangular pockets, leaving plenty of stock to leave on the floors and the walls. I didn't want to risk any end mill chatter digging deep enough into the aluminum to show up after my finishing toolpath. In my book, about 0.3 to 0.4 millimeters of stock to leave on the walls is good, and I keep about half of that amount on the floors. To finish the pockets of the isogrid pattern, I first applied a contour toolpath that touches only the walls. It stops 6 thou above the floor. 
Then I come in with a pocketing toolpath to clean up the floors. The radial stock to leave is set to prevent this toolpath from touching the walls. And then I have one last spring pass that sort of polishes the walls just a little bit deeper to within two thou of the floor of the pocket. Any closer and sometimes between axial loading, backlash, and machine accuracy, you'll see that contour pass leaving swirl marks on the floor that compete with the pocketing toolpath. Up next, I do a contour toolpath around the perimeter of the coaster with generous stock to leave. Since I don't know the exact position of my blanks, the CNC might be taking a bigger cut on one side of the coaster than the other, so my settings here are pretty conservative. Then, once that roughing pass is done, I can use a finishing contour toolpath to leave a better surface finish on those outside walls. To finish the top face, I'm using a scallop toolpath. I played with a few other toolpaths, but somehow this to me seemed to work the best. Then, after the one required tool change in this whole operation, I can apply a chamfering toolpath to clean everything up. You'll notice that throughout all these toolpaths, I'm making use of nested circular patterns. One pattern for the features within the coaster itself, and one pattern to cover the four coasters I'll have on my fixture at any given time. This is partly to save me from having to click on dozens of profiles, but mainly to reduce toolpath calculation time. The adaptive toolpath in particular really benefits from patterning. Let's see how this plays out on the CNC. First, we have to make that custom fixture I talked about earlier. I'm starting with a rejected Nomad 3 table held down with double-sided tape. I'll counterbore out the holes in the corners so I can more rigidly attach it to my actual table with machine screws. Then I'll deck off the fixture to get it to a consistent height. When you're dealing with aluminum plates, you should never trust the unmachined faces to be perfectly flat. You can see here that there was a dip of a couple thousandths of an inch on this plate. I will fix that by running this program again later at a lower height. While I still have a quarter inch single flute cutter in my spindle, I'll go ahead and bore out some finger holes to make it easier to remove my coasters after machining. Then I'll switch in an eighth inch cutter to machine out the locating grooves for my stock. When this is all done, I'll knock down any burrs with some fine grit sandpaper in lieu of a flattening stone, and to aid in aligning my stock, I 3D printed some rings that would align my blanks to the fixture's grooves. This was a lot easier than one of my earlier plans, which was to just eyeball the placement of the blanks. That was technically doable, as my margin of error was a millimeter, but it was a slow process that was both slightly tedious and slightly annoying with me sticking my head into a small CNC to make sure that the blanks were evenly overhanging the grooves. The adaptive roughing toolpaths for the IsoGrid coaster worked great. You'll notice in a lot of my footage that I'm using a chip fan here. The toolpath doesn't require this as the pockets are pretty shallow, but it does help keep the immediate work area clean. But there is an alternate motivation here, and that's to keep the aluminum cool. Double-sided tapes generally lose strength at high temperatures. Adaptive toolpaths are good at keeping your stock cooler because of the optimized interactions of the cutter with the material, but things can still get noticeably warm without augmented airflow in a tiny CNC. The chip fan here is just insurance. The finishing toolpaths here were tweaked over the course of several runs as I dialed things in. With the Nomad's lightweight spindle, you tend to need to take very light cuts in order to minimize tool marks. And I don't mean to imply that you absolutely need to baby the hell out of a Nomad 3, you can get perfectly serviceable parts going faster and with less attention to detail. But for a cosmetic, raw finish, you really need to ensure that the spindle can keep its RPMs up without bogging down at all, and that there's no possibility of chatter or vibration. I didn't want to hide any of the machining marks under sandblasting or powder coating. These toolpaths tell a story, plus no one bothers hiding them in the aerospace world. A tool change later and we can get some satisfying chamfering going. And then we're done. Pry, rinse, and repeat. It's a little over three hours to run a batch of four coasters, and I could leave this unattended for 95% of that time. I only really stuck around for the chamfering because it's quick to run, and I needed to reload stock after that. I made a couple of these coasters to prove out the process, and, well, just because I found the end product to be quite satisfying. Now, I will admit that I've glossed over a few things and not shown things in chronological order. For example, the pocketing for the cork actually needs to be done first if you want to use only double-sided tape. There's not enough surface area in the isogrid for adhesive work holding to be effective. Alternately, you can make a custom snug-fitting fixture and throw some clamps on the sides, but that's a little more complicated. In conclusion though, I'll say that the end result is actually more satisfying than I thought it would be. Compared to an early prototype I made, I found that one of the benefits of being so frugal with the cork on the bottom is that the coaster is even thinner in hand than you expect. It feels extra light and delicate, but it's still quite sturdy, 
Of course, as delighted by these coasters as I was, no project would be complete without a bit of retrospective contemplation, and two things I wasn't fully satisfied with were surface finish and speed. Surface finish would probably be something I could address with different tooling. A single flute is a great general purpose end mill, but there are end mills out there that focus on optimizing surface finish. I'm thinking a high helix 2 or 3 flute end mill would do the trick here, although that would mean another tool change and that's also not desirable. Speed, unfortunately, is largely a factor of power and to a lesser extent rigidity. The Nomad 3 runs out of the former before I'm able to extract the maximum material removal rate out of a given end mill. But let's be real, if I seriously wanted to maximize throughput, another 100 watts of spindle power wouldn't be enough to satisfy me. I would want to take the nuclear option and use a way more expensive CNC to make coasters, but that's another video. In the meantime, I'm going to try to get a couple of these coasters to Destin and Tori as a thank you for the free education and entertainment they've provided. I'll also be giving away a few early coaster prototypes to my Patreon supporters, and future iterations might be made available in a limited run on my website. Any details about that will be in the description below. And lastly, before I sign off, I wanted to provide a quick channel update. You might have noticed that I haven't uploaded a video in quite some time, and that's because I recently moved. My CNC machines and tools are partially in boxes, and the garage that will become a tiny machine shop is currently in shambles. Fingers crossed that I'm up and running in the next couple months though so I can get back to making more odd things to share, but until then, thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back eventually with more CNC content and aerospace-inspired nonsense.